I'll give you a quick background on myself. So I'm Ali Medavji. I founded three blockchain companies. The first was an exchange focused on the Indian market and now being refocused across uh, emerging markets in Southeast Asia. Uh, that's called Aluma. The second one is called the Blockchain Founders Fund, which is a uh, venture capital firm focused on token and equity-based investments. And the third one is, uh, is an accelerator focused on helping to build uh, blockchain ventures. And uh, to my left here, we've got uh, Patrick Shufal. He's a director of uh, LeToken in Southeast Asia and also a former COO of uh, Saxo Bank in Switzerland. And then we've got uh, Ramesh uh, Sura Paraju, uh, who is uh, from SAP and the blockchain technology uh, champion there. And then we've got Dr. Luan Nguyen, uh, who is a US general partner, uh, chief crypto architect and crypto officer of JWC Blockchain Ventures. And then finally, we've got Kachatur Guka Sian, president of the advisory board of the Swiss Blockchain Foundation. Uh, and so it is a pleasure to be here and I'm very honored and privileged to have such an accomplished and senior panel uh, from around the world. And so why don't we uh, give a few moments to each of our panelists to give an introduction uh, on themselves as well. Thank you very much, Ali. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you very much for coming in, coming here, attending the session. Um, I'm, I'm sure we will have an interesting discussion on crypto and the blockchain. So briefly on my background, well, Ali said most of it already. I'm, I'm here in Singapore now for almost a year. And what we try to do with La Token is actually to democratize the tokenization process, meaning we want to enable basically anyone to tokenize any assets. So we provide a platform, that's our vision, to tokenize assets so that this entire crypto and, and blockchain theme that is going on is open and available to anyone. And on this way of creating a, a asset tokenization platform, we are also creating a, an, a highly liquid exchange because we believe that you need to have an exchange so that you can then trade your tokens that they are not just another illiquid um, asset that you have. So that's our vision, becoming the, the world's foremost asset tokenization to the benefit of everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> I'm Ramesh, I'm from SAP. You might be aware that SAP is the world's uh, leading enterprise software and solutions uh, provider. And at SAP, I'm a blockchain champion, uh, meaning I bring the industry use cases for enterprise adoption and try to support from SAP technologies uh, how these use cases go from perception to proof of concept to production across industries. We are almost there in all of the 26 industries and we have worked with more than 16 industries now uh, to drive this adoption of blockchain along with other technologies, like we had the talk today regarding the marriage of AI, IoT, and blockchain, and how to bring this to add value to the industries in their use cases and their daily business. Thank you. My name is uh, Luan Nguyen. I'm, I'm deep in technology and business. Uh, my background from the uh, education standpoint is I got a PhD in electrical and computer engineering in 1989 in the area of artificial intelligence and also an MBA in uh, 2003, both from University of Texas at Austin. I was with IBM for 16 years. When I left IBM in 1999, I was part of the CDO leadership team for IBM Global Services to build uh, IBM Global Services in the area of strategic outsourcing. Then I uh, started up a lot of technology companies, sold them and invest in a lot of technology company. I've been deep into uh, machine learning, AI, and blockchain for the uh, last uh, four or five years and uh, participate in many of the ICO uh, and uh, financially uh, doing well. 
but then uh, because a lot of things that we see on the ICO things that I don't like, I want to improve on the crypto community, uh, build a better crypto and blockchain community. So I will start the JWC blockchain ventures to address some of the uh, 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 negative point of the ICO project so far. And I'm happy here to uh, share my uh, experience and my uh, uh, leadership talk regarding the topics. It was great. Uh, and hi everybody, my name is uh, Hachatur. If you can't pronounce, uh, it's Christopher, it's the same. Uh, I have a big, my background is uh, private banking and asset management. <coughs> in 2013, we launched an uh, asset management company in Switzerland, uh, cl classic, classic finance. Uh, and last several years, we are working uh, in the blockchain and uh, crypto area. What are we doing now? Now we're helping uh, several startups uh, to get the, their way from the idea to the end product. And first of all, to bring that uh, product to banks, to so institutional investors, to end clients. So our main, uh, our main goal now is uh, to help the idea to get the proof of uh, the business use case and then to fast uh, go the way from the just idea to the end product uh, from the point of view of the software solutions and end product for, for clients regarding the crypto and blockchain. Fantastic, thank you. So uh, thank you for, for the detailed introductions. And so before we continue, we'll go through some ground rules. So I'm gonna, uh, I prepared a few questions for each of our panelists. And then after that, we'll actually open up uh, two questions. So if you do have questions, we do want to hear from you. Feel free to address any of the panelists. If you want to make them controversial or difficult questions, they'll like that even more. Um, and, uh, and it'll make it much more interesting. And so why don't we start with Ramesh. So you're a blockchain champion for SAP who has worked hands-on with Ethereum, Hyperledger, and multi-chain. So tell us if and how you see blockchain disrupting enterprises. I would say uh, enterprises are adopting blockchain in a piecemeal approach. It's not about disruption. We see three horizons for adoption. The first phase, what we call is optimize, where you tweak in the existing enterprise software to bring in that additional value of blockchain. And then you go to the reimagine re part where you tweak the business process itself to accommodate the features and the security and the immutability of blockchain. And the third level or horizon is down the line, you revolutionize the business model, not just the business process. So I would say this year, we are more in the use cases of optimize where uh, blockchain is getting adopted to add on to the existing processes and bringing those quick wins in to get the technology familiarized with the internal IT and architects, and then go forward to the next horizons of innovation. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so, I mean, if, if any of our other panelists have thoughts uh, on that, I mean, feel free to jump in. I know Kachatur, you also work with banks and other enterprises. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I think like uh, um, blockchain itself, you uh, have a lot of disruption to many industry, but in order to uh, bring that to the mainstream and have uh, uh, the whole value bring by blockchain and other advanced technology, it have to be uh, coming from the uh, mindset of the top level of management, uh, w the different way of uh, thinking about approaching the solution, uh, thinking out of the box, uh, that's what we are doing today. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of large corporation today, uh, top management uh, team uh, are not uh, uh, forward thinking enough. It's a similar kind of things if you look at the um, uh, e-commerce uh, situation like seven years ago when Jeff go and talk to many different uh, 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 brick and mortar companies uh, about his uh, business model of Amazon 
uh, a lot of things uh, people doesn't get it or they say that oh yeah yes yes uh, and, and they revisit and things like that but look at seven years down the road now Amazon is one of the top uh, leading uh, company in the world and a lot of other companies are start shutting down the door like Sears uh, you know closed door JC Penney and even Walmart today is trying to struggling and how to buy uh, left and right e-commerce company and uh, to 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 to, to, to be survive in the survival mode. So, uh, so I, I see the similar kind of things happening in other industry. So, uh, and I think like more likely, uh, there will be a company that will be starting from scratch and with the new of the business model uh, on, the, uh, on the distribution of wealth uh, among uh, the mass, will be uh, creating and, and, and uh, be able to assemble a mass of people hundreds of millions and billions of people in a very short period of time that uh, could disrupt uh, 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 certain industry. Uh, <clears throat> from, from our side, I can say that uh, there are several parts of the financial and banking industry where the most impressive things are, are now happening. First of all, it's uh, all about the infrastructure and uh, blockchain and the assets on the blockchain, the cryptos, as a new, the next stage of the digitalization of the assets, it makes uh, things that the infrastructure from sluggish is just becoming the commodity. Uh, so the most uh, important thing now in the lot of banks that we see, they spend a lot of money, a lot of resources on the infrastructure. And it, we see how it becomes cheaper, faster, according to the new types of the audit, new types of control that are available according to the new technologies and the new applications on that. So this, in, in, in our part, the things like fund administrations, this is the most uh, changing, changing things and there is what we see now. Perfect, thank you. Um, and so on, on a similar note, I mean, Patrick, you've been an executive at Saxo Bank in Switzerland and the regional director of Litoken. And so you must see a lot of different projects. And so specifically, how do you think digital asset exchanges are impacting the finance industry? That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so I believe at the moment uh, we're just, just seeing the beginning of, of digital asset exchanges, but the, the potential volume is, is just tremendous. So if you think about it, you can, you can as I said, you can virtualize, uh, uh, virtually tokenize any asset and that, that um, uh, from, from an office building or hotel to, to a, uh, a painting that you have hanging on the wall, uh, a stash of gold under your bed, or the, to a, a hawker stand. So, essentially, um, we'll we'll see a new wave of of um, financial services being available to people who were previously not entitled to have that. So, uh, if you think about um, doing an, an IPO for an hawker stand no bank would take that on, right? But if, if we give the people the means to do it themselves, actually, and also uh, the correct processes to support it and safeguard their interests, um, there is a tremendous value out there. And as you said, I see various requests, and that is, that is from, from, from people who, who ask me, um, big banks, can we actually tokenize private equity investments? Uh, to make them more liquid, down to people who, who are in the possession of uh, a, tr a treasure, actually, a, a treasure that, that was um, uh, picked from the bottom of the sea and they want to, want to tokenize that as an investment. So there's all opportunities out there and the, and the spectrum of projects we see is, is tremendous. Uh, and, I, and I completely agree with that. And so looking at you know, these small business owners that can now potentially access credit or have, you know, better banking services is actually uh, a very big innovation sometimes that gets overlooked with some of the things that's happening with blockchain. And actually uh, sharing a little bit from a conversation I had with Luan yesterday evening, you know, we were also talking about how uh, cryptocurrencies actually allow uh, the banking of the bottom of the pyramid or the unbanked. And so, before or traditionally, you know, you might not be able to get a bank for 
the billion people at the bottom of the pyramid, but now within you know five to ten seconds, you can have an Ethereum wallet, and so and and or other cryptocurrencies. And this has actually already been used, for example, uh, by the UN, for example, with Syrian refugees, which actually helped uh, to provide Ethereum wallets for uh, refugees to liquidate their assets into Ethereum, and then this helps prevent theft and allows them to move their possessions, and then helps them to move back, for example, to uh, cash and buy other goods uh, once they arrive to their next destination. And so this is something that's already happening that sometimes is, is overlooked. Um, and so <clears throat> with that, I mean, the next question, um, I'll, I'll actually uh, bring over to Luan. And so as the lead for JWC Blockchain Ventures, how do you see blockchain impacting various industries from a portfolio perspective? And how do you think about uh, the investment side of, of the different industry uh, applications? I see a lot of uh, opportunity, um, especially like uh, looking at all of the ICO that happening in last year and then the first six months of this year. Uh, a lot of report coming out from 80 to 90 percent of the ICO uh, can raise money uh, pretty fast, pretty quickly, but then um, uh, we're not able to execute. And then I bow to like the three main reasons happening is like uh, for those uh, uh, non-executable ICO is like first, the uh, most of them is a white paper with an idea. So the idea is like a startup uh, with a lot of risk already built in. The, uh, that's the first reason. The second reason is like uh, with, uh, most of them want to apply just purely blockchain technology, uh, which is by itself is just uh, uh, providing a layers of the uh, communication and networking that needed. Um, so, and also a lot, not a lot of people in our community understand about the uh, blockchain technology, which is very new and is still evolving. Uh, how to apply those technology, what is the pro and con, what's the advantage, what disadvantage, what is capability today and maybe in the futures. So um, that, increase the tenfold of the risk of the projects. And then the third and the last reason is like um, a lot of uh, team members are very young. It's not very business savvy in the particular industry uh, about the country, about the localization, about our international uh, rollout. Also are not uh, very experienced in rolling out a solution that can be served to million, hundred million, billion of people and what the quality of service and the security and all these things. So to me, like uh, the 80, 95 percent of the uh, ICO successful raise and cannot execute is, you know, is, uh, is understandable. So beginning of the year, uh, we create the JWC Blockchain Ventures uh, to target into about 20 portfolio companies that already have uh, revenues, have millions of users and transactions. And then we uh, join venture with those companies and see to see how to apply blockchain other advanced technology like AI, machine learning, uh, to uh, provide a solution and to globalize and tokenize with the localization for this particular solution in many of different countries. And by, uh, by doing, by creating the JWC, JWC lab under the JWC blockchain ventures, we create a team uh, portfolio company can access to have a dozen of the blockchain developers, uh, thousand plus of the traditional software uh, uh, developers in the uh, mobile apps, in database, in the uh, all other tools to uh, quickly with economy of scale to roll out uh, the solution for those old company. And the industry may vary. It can be in the telecom uh, infrastructures, uh, it can be in the logistics, it can be in the healthcare, it can be in agriculture, and whatever is a field necessary that, that uh, we can create a joint partnership with. So, so fantastic. I, I think that's uh, a very useful insight in looking at, you know, uh, and, and you mentioned some of the ICO investments and how kind of that has evolved a little bit over time. Uh, but with that, I guess one of the more controversial questions that comes up is, you know, our topic is how blockchain will go mainstream. And so where does cryptocurrency fall into that? And does that need to be linked uh, with blockchain as a whole? And I'll, I'll leave that question open to any one of our, our panelists. Um, if, I, if I can uh, 
share my opinion. So I think I think we should we should distinguish two things, and that is um, blockchain and distributed ledgers as a, as an infrastructure layer and and coins, old coins that have been created on this infrastructure layer. So um, we have 1,600 um, coins and tokens out right now, and my personal take is that the vast majority of those will not survive. And um, that will be just a shakeout as the, as the industry will mature. However, the good news is that the fundamental technology will survive. So we can see it similar to the, um, to the birth of the internet bubble. With that happening, um, the internet wasn't gone. Uh, the web is still around. We still use emails and it's one of the most important sales channels that we have. So should the crypto bubble, if there is one, I, I personally think there is one, should that burst, we will still have the technology and that is meant to stay. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Patrick. Uh, blockchain as a broader fundament or an architectural set of concepts would stay and go mainstream across industries, whether cryptocurrency is adopted or not. Uh, people across industries are looking at the blockchain technology itself to survive and add value to their uh, business processes being in supply chain or food agree industry, provenance, financial sector, but the technology would always be of uh, additional value to the existing uh, landscapes that the customers have. Yeah. I would like to uh, stage the, uh, my view in the two different level. One is the macro level and one is the micro level. From the macro level, um, I believe that uh, the technology of blockchain and other advanced technology will not go mainstream, but will create a new mainstream. Uh, from the reason is like uh, it's a is the first in the history of the humankind we will have some kind of the technology to uh, 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 allow us to unleash other advanced technology like AI, machine learning, uh, big data analytics in the term of the social economics, in the term of the token economics. Because like uh, uh, overall our society have certain type of business model and certain type of uh, uh, economic that we are using today that really uh, uh, tie the whole world and our society back uh, as far as the growth. With the, with the new model, we will unleash the resource that, uh, and we are able to advance our, our society a, a, a lot much faster. In the term of, like, uh, for example, um, most of the big company that you're looking at, like a Facebook, Amazon, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, uh, whatever you may name, the business model is like we have an entity as a corporation, and then we s provide service to the mass. And the more that we survive to service the mass, all the profit is going back to the centralized entities, uh, uh, and all the profit and the wealth going to that entity, uh, which have representing about very lim limited numbers of the stockholders. But with the new technology of blockchain, the social economic is changed, and the blockchain have to be going with the cryptocurrency and the mining. And the reason because like with that, we're able to uh, 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 implement a lot of idea that you have in the past that we are not able to do. Such for example, like uh, uh, basic uh, uniform in income. And then uh, a lot of people saying like, if you give it to uh, the people $500 uh, a month for the, you know, the food and, and for the clothing and then uh, whatsoever, people can be unleashed there uh, skill, the thinking about like art, about the politics, about uh, technology and things like that. We can do that with mining. And if you're able to have a device like uh, about $20, $30 uh, give to a lot of people around the globe in the rural area without internet area, we're using radio frequency, you know, uh, Bluetooth, they're able to mine and have those kind of like a basic income uh, concept uh, done. And then the wealth when you build the more community you build, the wealth is more distributed more evenly to the mass of billion of people. So by doing that, because like uh, our society have a limited resource, everybody have a 24 hour in the day, we have limited resource and material. If you are able to cut down all of the like a third party unnecessary uh, and use of resource to unleash it to the mass and distribute the wealth among the mass, 
you know, society will be uh, moving forward and growth much faster. Uh, for example, if you don't need to sign a contract between two of us and have a notary guy to stamp things. So that is a wasting of resource right there. If we'll be able to use a resource to put in some other things, you know, imagine a lot of different things like that. If we'll be able to save and focus on different things, how is economy of the world or society is moved forward? So now I'm looking at the micro level. The blockchain itself will be evolving. I will have a lot of like, uh, idea about this and that, but reality is like, uh, to me, from the technology standpoint, blockchain provides a first layers of the trustless, immutable ledgers about the building the different of the uh, uh, consensus between the different people. Then a lot of uh, technology like AI, like uh, machine learning, big data have been developing for many years, but it was hold on to how to apply those things. If we have a layer two to apply AI, machine learning, big data analytics, then a lot of things will flourish. A lot of sol uh, solution can be done that the past will never be able to done. Uh, uh, example of cryptic this morning is one of the example. Then look at the third layer on the presentation layer with the uh, GUI, the graphical user interface, moving to UI UX today. If we have a third layer from the presentation that is using AR, like augmented reality, VR, virtual reality. So a lot of different ways that we can present it to the users from the localization from uh, Lou that mentioned this morning. Uh, so that is unleash a, a full range of the solution to the mass that never happened before and helping to move the society at the, uh, the world in the new direction. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a, a very interesting point. And I see a little bit of a, a difference in opinion, I think, with, you know, potentially cryptocurrency thriving versus uh, maybe maybe slowing down or being part of a, a bubble aspect. And so we'll go to our last question that I have before we open it up for questions uh, from you. And so the last question is for Katja Tour. Um, so as president of the advisory board of the Swiss Blockchain Foundation, you're in a cutting edge region. And so what are your views on regulation related to cryptocurrency and how does that impact the industry in the long run? It's said that, that from, the, from this point of view, there are several, several very interesting things. And one, one, one thought I just want to comment the, pre the, the previous question uh, regarding the mainstream or, or not mainstream. And it's also about the, about the financial industry. Now we see that uh, the blockchain by itself, it's uh, every industry, every part of the every small and big industries, they're trying to to implement or to try to change the business from classic one to the blockchain, just because the, this year and last year, last several years, it's uh, rather not very difficult to raise money and then just to try to do that. Uh, who, <coughs> who will survive and will it go to mainstream or no? I think that the, one of the very important things is when there will be the requirements for return on investments. Because now a lot of projects, 1,600 coins, uh, if you have a look on the white papers or on the projects, there are just a few, maybe sentences about the profit, about the profit and about the return on investments for for the token holders. Uh, so as though you have money, you can try. You are just trying, and then 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 we'll see what will come from. Uh, when we say about the about the, the the blockchain and the cryptos, we see that the blockchain is now, of course, uh, implementing a lot of banks, a lot of a lot of financial institutions are trying to be in the consortiums, they are trying to implement in different kinds of, uh, of business. But the main thing uh, regarding the crypto is the area that we see that uh, the blockchain is mainstream, the blockchain is of course good, uh, but just several banks in each region are working with cryptos. Uh, first of all, because uh, there is the lack of infrastructure for banks to work. The second one is the problem of the not until uh, sold until the end the AML procedures, uh, but we are sure that maybe in a year or two where it would be just in one button to push and to, to check the whole, uh, the whole history uh, of, the, of an asset, it would be for banks more preferable asset to work than the classic, uh, than the classic one. Uh, and when we say about the regulation, we see that uh, from last maybe 12, uh, 12 months, uh, the countries that were at the very front of the, of the industry, they are just going faster. 
and the others are coming uh, are, com are coming after them. In Europe, there are just the champions. Uh, in in, the, in this area, there always were some small champions in different kind of uh, interesting businesses like Gibraltar and Malta. Uh, Gibraltar was the first. Now, now, now Malta, also Estonia, also for Switzerland, uh, Germany. So we can say that the economic leaders are doing very well in this in this part. They are. Uh, providing the sandboxes where you can try, where you can implement your uh, your solutions. But from the point where we were maybe just several years ago to the point where it is implemented and it is something usual, I think it will it will take uh, it will take at least more time than we will think uh, we need for that. Oh, absolutely, and and one point that you mentioned in particular was these sandboxes, and so you might have seen these in different regions and so for example like Taiwan and Singapore and you know Canada has sandboxes and a number of other countries and they're basically an area if you're not familiar it's where you can try out or you know go in and and, and talk to the regulator without really any repercussions and you can basically ask questions and see whether or not you can try out your company some of these sandboxes you know guarantee banking services for a couple of years or some of them uh, basically will allow you to test out your blockchain and launch your ICO or other things without repercussions uh, in the short run. So it's it's a pretty interesting concept. A lot of them don't work very well, so a lot of them actually prevent innovation. So for example, my personal take on the Canadian one is that it actually prevents innovation because the regulator actually just tells you not to launch your ICO or not to launch your blockchain company. Um, and, and, and so there, there's mi mixed takes on them, but, but some of them are actually quite successful. Um, does anyone else have any views on uh, basically the regulatory landscape and how that will affect uh, blockchain? Yes, uh, I have uh, some of the, my uh, thought about the fintech. I think like uh, as a community, as a blockchain community, a crypto communities, um, we, sh we should uh, uh, help and, 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 and motivate it, uh, projects that uh, involve in the fintech because like most of the bank uh, system, the centralized bank, uh, central bank and centralized bank, they always want to have uh, uh, application to move fiat to cryptocurrency and then move it back to fiat. But to me, that's, uh, uh, that's not the right way. The right way is like we're using the K, uh, 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 KYC and AML from existing uh, banking system to bring people on board to change the fiat to the cryptocurrency. And we have to build a system in the cryptocurrency system that people feel comfortable to uh, do uh, commerce, e-commerce, blockchain commerce on that. And I don't need to forget about coming back, uh, go back to fiat. Why do we need to go back to fiat? You know, if we have a, can buy product and services using the cryptocurrency and easy cross-border and things, why do we need to go to fiat? Uh, I think that is uh, very destructive to go back to fiat. Uh, so the, the whole thing is like we have to build our system, our solution. So once people can be on a, a cryptocurrency, they be able to get the pro, pro, provide people provide product and services in the at the cryptocurrency uh, level. They feel comfortable, they feel secure. They uh, they can do it easily, and that then will be successful. Let's have one last one last comment. Yeah, I I um I I totally agree with uh, Luan. The, what we see is that um, in many jurisdictions, we actually try to apply laws which are d decades old, um, if, if not even a century in the US uh, for securities, um, to apply that to the current situation um, where we have an entirely different technological setup. And um, I think the regulators must go um, along with us and, and must think out of the box how to how to actually regulate this new phenomenon. And um, I think the MAS is, is doing a good job. Um, they are, are trying to adapting and be um, accommodating for this, this new trend. And uh, the last remark I want to make is that we as a, as a crypto community also have, of course, the opportunity to implement certain rules of, of self-regulation or, or um, set up self-regulating bodies um, and so we can actually be even faster than the than the regulator in, in setting certain standards and in actually giving certain certificates out so that the investors 
are not harmed by this new trend that we see. No, a a absolutely, and, and on that point, actually, I'm a, I'm a very, very much in favor of self-regulation, and you know, I actually think that as uh, you know, people in this industry that you know have a, have a role to play, and, and for all of you, as you see bad actors, I think we have a responsibility to help push them out of this industry because that will help to increase you know the level of quality and help provide uh, assurances and protections uh, for the industry as a whole, which will fuel the growth of it. And so with that, why don't we open it up to questions? Uh, so if you have a question, sure. So, so uh, to, to answer this, this question very, very generally, um, we are trying to bring as much already now liquidity to our exchange as possible. So, um, and by having a big uh, pool of liquidity or a big, a big crowd of, of people on our platform, we hope that um, these new assets that, that are being added that they find some interest. And um, we believe that the bigger the diversity of our, our offering is actually, um, the more, more niches can be covered or we can even um, find certain assets that have not been traded so far. As I mentioned, this, this, um, this treasure that, that was found at the bottom of the sea, this could be an additional asset class which was not open so far to other investors so it is about the diversity of of the assets existing and the liquidity that is potentially out there to buy these assets sure we got a question over here Okay, uh, when you talk about Bitcoin and the Ethereum public, you are talking about the public networks. Yeah. Obviously, there are uh, business networks which have been around uh, before blockchain. If you take a typical import-export scenario, there would be an importer, exporter, the banks, the customs. It's a business network which is thriving in a permissioned way, uh, maybe not with blockchain or not still with blockchain. But uh, what we look at uh, from SAP perspective is not centralizing the databases, but going for permissioned blockchain networks rather than public blockchain networks. The technology is not that important. It could be Ethereum consortium, which is having permissioned players in it, or Hyperledger or multi-chain. Uh, but the more important thing is uh, to convince these network players to come on board so the vendors out there like Amazon, IBM, or uh, SAP, we are not trying to centralize any installations of blockchain. We are trying to promote these permissioned uh, networks where there is, an, of course, a license for us, but more important, the problem is also, or the challenge is also that the network players should come on board into such permission networks. Probably there would be network of networks where there would be some hyperledger, some Ethereum, some multi-chain, um, but we are not trying to centralize that as of now. Thank you. So we'll up, open up to one or two more questions. Uh, yeah, right over here.
So the question is, what is the impact going to be on the job market, and how do people essentially prepare for that change? So I can say that from my point of view, the impact is huge, and the impact is bad. I think that is a wide out to the uh, freedom of choice to the individual. So uh, I, my vision is in the future, like uh, each of us have certain type of the skill set, expertise to contribute to the society. So normally that you have to uh, go and apply to a companies and you work for them. Uh, but then uh, now if you can be able to tokenize that, uh, 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 we see that uh, a lot of uh, uh, people uh, in the society are moving to that direction anyway. Uh, like uh, you can post the value of the expertise uh, of the experience on the, uh, on the blockchain in the tokenized way and uh, a, a team of assemble of team to provide a particular solution to provide to the large society can be uh, uh, established uh, with the individual and execute the project very fast based on the expertise combination of the group, the team. And so that's how the, I think the, the job market is evolving in the future. We, has, we already start to see a lot of freelancers, and then this is just provide a platform so you can have more of the freelancer. Um, if, if I can briefly add on that. Um, so if we, if we take a step back and, and look at it from really from a helicopter perspective, um, the, the blockchain will bring about efficiencies and, and per se, and, and really in the big scale. And so, these efficiencies should be to the benefit of everyone, right? I think it then depends on how these benefits are distributed. And um, that means um, if we look at the labor market, if, if there are just a few players who will benefit from blockchain implementation and reap all the benefits, we, we would have a significant problem. If, however, the money is funneled back and is, is funneled into projects that actually help broader society by applying the blockchain and also like mining or mining our own data, um, we can have a very beneficial situation. Yeah, maybe a last remark. Uh, the whole idea of blockchain to me is a risk reduction without intermediaries. So if you are looking at jobs which are, for example, the notary or the bank, which is just vetting and validating documents, probably that's some kind of jobs that would not be there in future when blockchain is uh, introducing those efficiencies and trying to uh, leave out the intermediaries. Uh, that's definitely a, a area which we should not look at uh, planning our careers on. Okay, and so we've got one last question, or we've got two, two questions. Let's go over here first. Um, hi, thank you. Uh, you guys mentioned self-regulating bodies feedback. So I think the industry would agree that it makes sense to regulate the bodies feedback because it's really important to the A, a very good question, and uh, since I'm the moderator, I'll let the others answer this one. <laughs> um, indeed, it's a, it's a very good question, and, and yeah, how to slice the elephant, right? Um, I mean, we, we could look um, look at um, different angles, uh, we, and and it could be one solution could indeed be um, having having the parties who do. ICOs, token sales, and trading forming one body. That, that could be a solution to, um, to try to set standards for ICOs and to set standards for, for proper trading. Um, so bundling, bundling certain players of the, of the entire crypto industry up and forming their regulatory um, framework and their regulatory association that could be one way of doing it and similarly doing it maybe for other areas of the 
of the entire cryptosphere. Oh, do you have a, a, one I more th comment? I think one of the area of the SEGO regulatory uh, would be uh, some advancement in uh, solution provided by a lot of uh, foundation now there. Uh, the, the things like uh, providing through the blockchain technology is the governance that is very unique. Uh, so uh, I expect they have a lot of uh, consensus algor uh, algorithm and implementation that how to do the self-regulatory, either the POW, POS, the POS, or POP, like we see, or POC, or proof of uh, uh, capacities, uh, will be a mechanism of the governance for the self-governance. Uh, uh, I would like to add that uh, this in this but I'm totally agree with Patrick. Uh, I think that in now we're talking about the whole blockchain, the, about the whole cryptocurrencies industry. But as it is in the classic in the classic world, there is the union of insurance companies, there is the organization of banking industry. And uh, here the industry, when it is a little bit maybe grow grower, uh, structured different parts of the industry that are together communicating with the authority who is giving the borders inside that borders the exact sphere exact industry is uh, providing the rules for the, for the first of all the investors clients and uh, and, author and authorities and this is where we where we are going now and we already see different kinds of associations organizations that first are are uh, launched in the one territory, then uh, cross-regional, and then cross uh, cross-continental organizations. And this this is what we see in this world right now. Perfect. So I, I mean, I think that gives us a couple of ideas on on self-regulating bodies. But I, I do think it's something that we do need to, you know, as a group, also sit down and really, you know, figure out what is the ideal way and how can that work and what does the governance look like and may, maybe that uses blockchain and and some sort of consensus model and governance model, right? Um, and so why don't we go over to the last question which we had over here. Um, I, I'll give you the classic answer. It depends. So, um, <laughs> because <laughs> because um, my take is um, the blockchain, de decentralized ledgers, they come not only as a technology but also as a paradigm. So um, there is also some cultural aspect to it. Now, look for instance at Switzerland. Switzerland is a hugely decentralized country. It is, it is fully transparent. Um, it is bottom up. So this is basically an environment also where, where the me mental mindset is absolutely open to this idea of decentralized ledgers. So I think they're, they're, they had some advantage and that's also why it developed very fast there. There will be other countries that may may be advanced in terms of technology, but maybe not in terms of the paradigm, and their adoption will take longer, also due to political resistance, clearly. Ramesh? Okay, with respect to cryptocurrency, it's my personal opinion that it would stay alongside the classical currencies for a while, maybe a couple of years down the line. With respect to the technology of DLT and blockchain itself, uh, we as SAP think that in a time frame of 18 to 24 months, uh, most of the industries will talk about putting some data in blockchain and leveraging that. The, the consultant answer is uh, depend, but then uh, I let you know about my viewpoint. I think like uh, base, uh, I'm a privilege of the, um, uh, traveling about 20 days a month and a meeting with the top leadership people in the area of the cryptocurrency and the blockchain. Um, so my view, uh, I met with CZ in uh, Binance, where he built like from zero to uh, 1.5 billion in seven months. Uh, Jihan Wu from Bitman, I the uh, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, crypto miner, 
machine, like when he started 29 and he's 32 uh, now. It's a, a multi-billion people. Uh, and other uh, technology uh, and, and, uh, and crypto uh, leaders. And uh, the, the thing is like I'm very uh, positive because the, the mind, uh, my share and my thought leadership of those people are very uh, society oriented than uh, just profit oriented. So, um, but now look at what I see and it will be a, like a, a consolidation of the infrastructures for blockchains is about one at 1.5 to two years. When you have, right now we have a, a, a lot of public chain, private chain, hyperledger, hashgraph, uh, side chain, cross chain. Uh, so those sort of things could be consolidated in 1.5 to two years. From the uh, technology standpoint, it's like open system, like a window like uh, uh, Mac OS and things like that. Once we have that kind of things, uh, all of the uh, distributed apps, the apps will be flourish with uh, 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 right, right away, like uh, within like three to uh, five years more and uh, provide real solution to address the real user needs that bring the value to the society into the mass. And that's where we can see about five years. I see, uh, I, I see like uh, we, we have a lot of change on the way that we interact to each other uh, from country to the other countries. And then now, talking about the central government, uh, each of the country, we have about 500 countries in the world. So a lot of large uh, 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 countries, they have a large body regulated here and there. You know, it depends on the, uh, the, the central government whether they, uh, if they're smart, they realize by now like uh, uh, you know, that they, they cannot suppress crypto and blockchain, they cannot stop it, like China tried to did, did that in July last year, turned out to be activity about crypto and related things uh, 10 times fall bigger today. Um, so they, if they're smart, they will have to figure out a way how to work with the blockchain and the cryptocurrency. But nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, the blockchain technology uh, uh, provides a level playing field between the large country to the small countries a large city to the small cities. So they have a lot of opportunity for a small country and a small city to flourish and become a, a, a new solution provider uh, cross border. So I, I'm, I'm very encouraging and I see like it's about five year time frame. I can say that <clears throat> from my point of view, it's uh, sooner than later uh, because this year we were facing very important things uh, because uh, as it was mentioned, the cryptos and the blockchain, it's uh, the phenomenon and for regulators, it is something new. And now we see that uh, the G20, we see the FATFA rules, uh, we face that the main organizations who are providing the rules for the global financial industry and the recommendations for different regions, they are working on, this, on these issues. As though they are not very fast, but they have started uh, not they started not, not, not yesterday. Uh, we can be sure that maybe until the year, uh, this, this, uh, this year or, or next year, there already would be some general recommendations and rules how to work. And after that, the local governments and the local uh, financial uh, authorities will be much more faster in implementing the rules, the technology and uh, different different uh, types of, of solutions in the in the market so sooner than later i think yeah and if i can add on to that i mean from, from my personal take I won't, I won't give you a number but what i can tell you is the number of fortune 500s or major banks that have actually even personally you know reached out to me and shown me what they're working on behind the scenes is incredible and there are a lot of companies a lot of banks that are actually working on blockchain solutions and haven't even disclosed these things uh, publicly and so you know it's a matter of time before from a governance standpoint they actually decide to you know approve this through their boards and basically you know hit a switch and can launch certain you know blockchain related uh, technologies within their companies or you know for example banks could launch products for wealth management relating to uh, cryptocurrencies and and, and uh, blockchain and so there are very interesting things also happening in the background that are not uh, being seen yet so with that, uh, to wrap up, I've got a, a final exercise. And so 
It's going to be a one sentence exercise, and I want each of the panelists to finish this sentence. Blockchain technology will. Oh, wow. Um, blockchain technology will change the lives of all of us, hopefully, to the benefit of all of us. Will improve a lot of efficiencies in the industries. Blockchain will uh, provide great impact to a billion of the people with a better uh, wealth distribution, uh, uh, social, uh, economic model. Well, most of our uh, blockchain technology will will bring uh, such changes as we cannot maybe imagine even now. Perfect, thank you. So I really hope that you all enjoyed uh, this panel and please give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.